Thanks. All right. So uh, welcome everyone to the CU Systems Lab uh, virtual recruitment info session for the year 2020. I'll be your MC and host, uh, Eric Rosner. I'm a, a professor here at, at Colorado. We've got a small slide deck we'll go through. Um, if anyone's on the call, wants to um, uh, ask any questions throughout, please feel free to interrupt us. Um, this is being recorded, so um, just take mind of that. And if you uh, don't want to be recorded, uh, you can reach out to us afterwards and we'd be happy to respond over email or set up another chat as necessary. <clears throat> okay, so um, who we are, this is I think a word cloud that Dirk did. I think he, I think he took all of our websites or something like that and, and created a word cloud just to give you all kind of an idea of what we work on. And, and this is a word cloud that would constantly be changing, you know, over time um, because we're uh, constantly looking at new problems and, and new areas. But you can see we have uh, networks and systems, security, distributed, um, IoT edge I see in there, social, drones, cyberbullying, um, lots of interesting stuff on there. Um, someone might want to mute themselves. I hear a little bit of a background. Um, and we do have a, a web page system. Are you the co-host so I can mute them? Uh, yeah, let me Thank see you. if I know how to do that. Just go to participants, my name, and then co-host. Let's see, Audrey. Mute co-host, got it. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Rashri. <clears throat> so we try to keep our web page mostly up to date. Um, we're not always great at it, um, but you know, check out our. It has links to to us and our system fact, our individual faculty pages, which we sometimes do a little bit better job of keeping more up to date. Um, this is our uh, faculty that we have at the systems lab um, with kind of um, areas that we're all interested in. Uh, unfortunately, everyone's not able to join today, um, but if there is someone who you really want to talk to, we encourage you to reach out to them um, and, and try to get a hold of them offline. Um, and the, the folks that are here, we'll, we'll let them all kind of go over and introduce themselves <clears throat> and talk about their areas a, a little bit. Um, and any of the faculty, if there's something that I need to be saying, just, just let me know. Um, our faculty, we, we span three departments. Most of us are housed in computer science, but we have um, a few oddballs in uh, electrical and computer engineering and um, our, our telecom program, TCP, technology, cybersecurity, and, and policy, um, who are a little less odd, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so uh, we, we all collaborate, though, pretty closely as, as faculty. We have, you know, a weekly lunch session. We get together. Um, we'll talk about things we do with all the student body and our students all kind of sit in the same general area. Um, we had some faculty that joined us last year, Nolan, uh, Tam Tamara, and Joe, um, which I know Nolan's here. And uh, Tamara, I think, had her own session. So if you're interested in talking with her or looking at her session, um, reach out to Rajri or check uh, whatever I'm, you need I'm to, here. to find that. Oh, she is here. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry, Tamara. No, no worries. Um, so, um, who we are, our faculty, you know, we do a lot of research. We're passionate about research. Um, this is a graphic for uh, Sangte, Professor Sangte Ha winning, and, and Dirk, who's not in here, uh, winning best paper award at uh, Mobisys last year for their work on showing that uh, 5G is, is insecure. Um, so they do a lot of really practical, high impact uh, work. Boulder and Denver, as many of you may know, is a tech hub. And a lot of us are, since we're in systems, are pretty passionate about practical problems. And as a result, we have a lot of collaboration with local companies. Um, there's a lot of local research labs and government agencies, which we'll talk about, um, and uh, uh, startups. In fact, a lot of our students end up just kind of staying, especially undergraduates and, and, and um, uh, some graduate students end up just staying in the Boulder, Denver area, because there's a lot of great stuff going on here and people love to live here. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, if anything else wants to be added there, just chime in folks. Um, we also have postdocs. Um, so uh, Sangte has been working with uh, lots of postdocs and uh, mostly working on kind of 5G and cellular technologies. They've been doing a lot of great work um, publishing in that area. Um, and uh, we have a pretty wide variety of students. This is only a, a sampling. We have much more students uh, than this. Um, but we have students, you know, from all over the globe, uh, from the US, all with 
different interests. Um, and, and we have a really nice kind of uh, set of students who are really passionate about computer science and they help organize things. We'll talk about like our uh, twice yearly barbecues that's, that's usually um, driven by the students. And uh, so, so we have a lot of great students, um, especially students that like to ski and hike. <laughs> we end up getting lots of those, although you don't have to uh, like those things to come here. Um, these are some of our past students. Uh, none of them are mine because I'm still relatively junior, but we've done a great job at getting students at high-end universities and high-end uh, companies. So you can just see a few here um, that, that we've listed. And this is an ever-growing uh, list, thankfully. And this is something that we're some of the most proud of is, is our alumni um, out there having real impact and, and, um, and being successful in, in uh, academia and in industry. Um, let's see, advance. All right, so now we have, I guess, just a, uh, one slide uh, for each professor, and we'll just, I'll just let, hand the mic over to each professor so they can give maybe their um, like one minute, two minute spiel on, on kind of things they're interested in. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, so I'll go first. So I'm uh, Qing Lu, I go by Christine. So my uh, area of research really focus on this full stack data and, uh, and analytics. So the goal is really to integrate systems, algorithm, application together so that we can have effective and efficient uh, data analytics solutions. So uh, starting from the systems level, so I work a lot uh, in the areas of mobile wearable IoT sensing, uh, where like we're designing new sensing capabilities so that we can sense a wide variety of uh, like scenarios. So like going, spanning from air quality, people's driving behavior, earthquake detection, running, uh, exercise and also gesture and the group events. Uh, so with the kind of data you collect from the systems layer and then we go up to the algorithm layer where we focus a lot in terms of how we manage the data, how we analyze the data efficiently. Um, so some of the key topics I look at uh, include like multimodal data fusion. So this is where you try to incorporate uh, very different types of data and also usually those are like a, a very in terms of like spatial temporal granularity and also you could have text data, you could have graph data uh, or like images as well. So when you're putting this all together, then of course we're trying to infer various aspects of like the context and the users. Um, anomaly detection is a lot related to kind of spatial temporal data. So what we're trying to do is that we want to design algorithm to automatically detect anomalies. So knowing that many of those anomalies are contextualized. So that means you don't have a kind of global definition about what is an anomaly, right? You really need to see in what kind of scenarios this is considered different, right, from others. Um, another angle is recommendation, right? So this is a particular uh, useful when you have a lot of data and you're trying to help your users, right, or systems to identify kind of like items of interest, okay? Uh, so we have the kind of both from more like the user side uh, in terms of like recommending uh, like uh, news items, right? For like online social communities, but also we did a lot of more kind of fundamental, uh, like a, a more kind of theoretical oriented research where you look at like, like collaborative filtering, like uh, matrix approximation in general. And we try to look at the, the stability and also like uh, how you can combine both the local information and the global information together so that we, we can improve the overall uh, performance of recommendation. Um, I work with a lot of applications. Uh, here, like I can see, like I roughly put this into two categories, uh, both from the scientific side and also from like ubiquitous computing, which are more like a user centric. Um, once I really want to highlight, like I really enjoyed like being here at the border is that I can I have uh, kind of very good collaborations with like say, the other departments on campus, but also uh, quite a few natural labs that are close by. So I work with people in environmental science, uh, like earth science in general. Uh, NOAA is close by, so we're looking at like fisheries data. Uh, also like renewable energy and the transportation electrification. Uh, from the ubiquitous computing side, this general set is about the users. Right? We're trying to understand use, like individual user behavior, group user behavior, and also some of their like just events and also kind of like context. And I also put the bridge between scientific discovery and ubiquitous computing because these two are really closely related in many settings. So overall, 
data analytics, but we're trying to integrate systems and algorithm application together. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks, Christine. So I think we'll just um, maybe just go one through one, and then we can let students uh, ask questions at the end. Um, okay, Shiv. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Shiv Mishra, and I'm a professor in the uh, computer science uh, department. And uh, my research, uh, you know, I, I do research in a lot of different areas. Um, broadly, you can uh, classify that research into two, um, you know, high level areas. One is more uh, traditional systems oriented research, um, where uh, um, I'm working with uh, things like, at present, I'm working with, you know, in mainly providing system level support for essentially Internet of Things or uh, smart cities. Uh, so if you look at the slide, you know, the top one, basically the edge computing is one of the primary uh, research area right now. Um, the main thing I'm trying to look at there is essentially trying to do artificial intelligence, you know, doing machine learning, deep learning at the edge. At the edge basically means uh, uh, making use of, uh, um, you know, end devices like sensors and the smartphones and uh, those kind of things, along with some kind of uh, at server that could consist of uh, traditional CPU based systems, but also looking at uh, other uh, ASICs like, uh, um, you know, FPGAs, GPUs and things like that. And how we can basically uh, compute uh, deep learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms, you know, how we can do, uh, you know, face recognition or um, augmented reality kind of application, uh, satisfying the strict uh, latency guarantees uh, at the edge. Uh, so the, my my uh, goal there is to basically provide system level support at that level. Um, related to that, you know, I'm exploring things like efficient and dynamic container orchestration, serverless computing at the edge, and so on. Um, somewhat related to uh, edge uh, to Internet of Things, but also incorporating um, the social aspect is another project which is uh, listed here on the lower left, which is socio technical system. So this is basically a new project that uh, I just got uh, funded. And uh, the goal of that project is to essentially build a socio-technical system, uh, which, is, uh, which will be comprised of environmental sensors, smartphone platforms, data analytics servers that are addictive, uh, predict, you know, uh, equipped with uh, uh, predictive modeling, visualization, and so on. And the goal is to basically understand how, you know, what we call, uh, um, planned disruptive events, things like, you know, a major construction project uh, that takes place, how it impacts the uh, social and, you know, the um, health and well, well-being of people who live in the neighborhood of that, uh, that project. So in particular, right now, in this particular project, we are studying um, a project called C70 project, which is basically a major construction happening on, uh, uh, on the internet highway, you know, uh, says uh, C70. And the place where this construction is happening, you know, basically the communities, they are low socioeconomic uh, communities, uh, you know, low education, highly Hispanic population. And uh, we are basically building this whole uh, IoT environment and um, comprised of all these sensors and uh, uh, smartphone applications to understand how this, uh, uh, this uh, project is impacting their social um, um, and their well being, their health, and so on. And, the goal is basically to essentially build tools eventually so that we can do something to mitigate the negative impacts of these, uh, uh, these projects. So, um, another interesting project that uh, I'm uh, working on is uh, uh, democracy and technology. And this is basically a joint work with uh, several of my colleagues here at uh, Systems, like you know, Christine that you just heard from, uh, Rekhan, uh, Tamara Liman. So we are basically trying to understand how uh, the social media, the technology right now is impacting the democratic process. So in particular, you know, we have uh, most, more recently looked at uh, the impact of uh, Russian bots, you know, that were very active in back in the uh, 2016 election, how they impacted the behavior of the end users who came in, in contact with these bots. Um, we are also looking at, you know, how, you know, um, how, what we can do about misleading news uh, how users identify whether a particular news is uh, fake or not, uh, with the eventual goal, you know, to uh, make users resilient to such misleading news, and also maybe incorporate some kind of interventions where the users can, um, you know, uh, can uh, 
um, you know, um, understand, you know, that certain uh, news that is being circulated is misleading or propaganda and things like that. So that's basically a very uh, small uh, overview of my research. Uh, my web page, of course, has much more details about this, and I will be very happy to talk to you if you are interested in any of this. I am right now actually hiring PhD students. I have uh, multiple projects that are uh, funded more recent, very recently. So definitely, if you are interested in any kind of things like you know systems, edge computing, IoT, or social computing things like you know um, you know democracy, technology, anything like that, you know, just contact me. Okay. Great. Thanks, Shiv. One quick note for, for students, because I didn't know this when I was applying for graduate schools, but look for faculty. One, one good strategy is to look for faculty that have funding because you're much more likely to get accepted if you have a match because those professors are actively looking for students to work on the projects that they have funded. Um, and, and typically being on a project that's funded is good for you because if you can be something like a research assistant instead of a teacher, a teaching assistant, you can um, focus a lot more on your research. Um, so it's not a hard, fast rule, but it's a, it's a tip at least. Okay, um, Nolan. Hi everybody, I'm Nolan Scaife. I, uh, I'm one of the, the new security faculty here at CU. Um, my background is from industry. I came from industry, so uh, in various different roles from operations, engineering, development, leadership. Um, and my research interests are in uh, security problems that affect uh, consumers and, and, and everyday people. And so that's led me into working on problems of ransomware, financial fraud, and so forth. Um, uh, I, my students have, um, have recently been working on projects to use, for example, augmented reality to try and identify tampering at ATMs and payment terminals. Uh, and building a framework for evaluating uh, ransomware detectors, because we, you know, we know that we, there are so many works out there that that say, "Hey, we're the best at at detecting this stuff," but yet it's still such a major problem that we're trying to identify what's going wrong and why this uh, this kind of thing continues to be a problem. Um, my work in in payments and ransomware has spawned two startups, and I think that that's one of the uh, big advantages of being at CU is that a lot of students go on to commercialize technology and 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 I think that when you're working on important problems that affect uh, a lot of people that those opportunities naturally arise and so um, this is an environment where you can take care of those kinds of um, and take advantage of those kinds of things. Um, and if you want more information on me, my website is uh, on the slide, uh, or I have a statistically improbable name. You can Google me, um, uh, but thanks. All right, cool. Thanks, Nolan. Um, I also have a statistically improbable name. I think there's only one other Eric Rosner out there. Hopefully only one, at least that I've seen. Um, yeah, so I'm Eric. Um, like Nolan, I spent a bunch of time in industry before joining CU. I spent seven years um, uh, combined between AT&T Lab Search and IBM Research. Um, as a result, my interests are, are pretty broad. You know, I, I have an interest in just kind of systems and networking in general, um, but I tend to focus in areas like wireless communication, mobile computing, data center network, cloud computing, um, and serverless computing, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, I, I kind of have uh, research in two main thrusts now, although I do have side projects in other areas like optimizing um, training for distributed learning. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk mostly about um, th these two. So um, the, the first um, kind of thrust is uh, I call the smart edge. And, and I have an NSF grant where I'm looking at new ways I can manage wireless networks. And, and the basic idea is that in today's environment, we have this massive proliferation of sensors. We have video cameras, we have wearables, we have personal assistants. And what we can do is we can take that sensor data and we can analyze it to gain context of users and their environments. And what I'm wondering is, can we take this, this, this context that we can derive um, from these sensors to maybe manage wireless networks in, in kind of new and innovative ways? So, so one example might be is pretend I'm going to a CU football game and CU really wants everyone, you know, to wear CU gear to, you know, show their pride. 
And maybe they could come up with some policy that if a user is wearing a CU hat or a CU shirt or something like that, they would get free Wi-Fi. And currently there's no kind of way to do this, but with um, this, this research grant that I'm trying to look into is to enable ways to do this. Like if we had video cameras deployed throughout the area, could we identify users that are actually wearing their CU gear, identify their devices, and then maybe instrument some sort of network policy, like giving them free Wi-Fi. Um, so there's a lot of hard problems to solve in, in doing this. We need to be able to do all this analytics of, of this um, sensor data, um, hopefully at the network edge, because we need to have really kind of low latency um, access to this information. Um, so as a result, we're looking at a lot of machine learning optimization, especially deep learning based approaches um, on limited or constrained um, environments. Um, so, so I have a variety of students ranging from master students to PhD students kind of working on this now. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm always looking for uh, help or interested students there um, if needed. And then the other major kind of thrust I have right now is, is serverless computing. Uh, we just had a paper accepted in ACM SOC on uh, providing a, a QoS framework to better manage um, serverless workloads. And serverless is basically a new uh, paradigm to, to kind of program and utilize the cloud um, at scale in a very simple uh, fashion. Um, so this is you know, an emerging workload that's becoming more and more popular, um, but there's not really good ways to manage these kind of workloads or applications yet. So we, we kind of took a first stab at seeing if we could build kind of a rich uh, scheduling and QoS framework for these sorts of things. Um, and we're continuing to work in this area, looking at new primitives to maybe make uh, serverless computing more efficient and um, doing some kind of like measurement studies to see if we might be able to learn uh, behavior of serverless applications over time in order to maybe uh, provide optimizations. Um, because of my time in industry and, and I, I typically like to work on more practical problems. So as a result, I um, uh, <clears throat> collaborate pretty heavily with industry. So I have collaborators with HPE, IBM, um, AT&T and Cisco. Um, so, uh, so that's been pretty nice because then some of my students can go intern at these places or maybe get access to like real test beds at something like AT&T or um, maybe, you know, um, more state-of-the-art test beds at something like HPE. So um, that's me. My the ice cream is, a, is, is a misleading. I can't eat ice cream anymore. So I'm going to have to upgrade my picture at some point. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Um, Joe. Joe on. Mm, I don't think he is. All right, so this, this is Joe's slide, so I'll just keep it up um, just very briefly for students to look over. Um, I would encourage you all to take a look at Joe's website. He's had a lot of um, recent publications in, um, in, in really good venues. Um, doing a lot of stuff in persistent memory, RDMA, and uh, kind of new storage and memory um, uh, primitives. Uh, so, so take a look at uh, his website. Um, let's see, next. Uh, Rick is probably also not online. Rick uh, has been working pretty closely with uh, Shiv and Christine. Um, in addition, he's been working on a lot of uh, drone um, detection and localization um, uh, approaches lately. Um, he's looking at integrating artificial intelligence and machine learning into OS to build kind of like a smart OS. And then he's collaborating with me and Eric Keller on building um, new ways in which cloud workloads can automatically and easily kind of um, scale out, uh, which we call uh, Elastic OS. Um, so again, take a look at, at his um, webpage and some of his uh, works. Um, Rick will be um, going on leave starting next year. Um, so he might not be looking for students. I think you should reach out to Rick directly if you're interested in working with him. Um, but he will be still collaborating, I'd imagine, very closely with all of us because he, he um, works closely with us on, on a lot of these projects. Uh, the drone stuff, he works with TAM, um, which I didn't mention earlier. <clears throat> okay, um, Tamara? Yep. 
Hi everyone, my name is Tamara Lehman. I'm an assistant professor in the electrical computer and energy engineering department. And I also have a, a courtesy appointment in the computer science department. So I could advise students in either department. Um, I joined CU a year ago, so I guess I'm technically brand new too, <laughs> uh, just like Nolan. And I just finished my PhD a year ago uh, from Duke University. Um, I focused on my PhD on developing architectures for secure memory systems and to lower the performance overhead. And then uh, throughout my PhD, I actually interned with Intel SGX team at Intel Labs um, a couple of times. And that was kind of fun because I got to work on my research while also doing an internship and getting paid. Uh, so that was fun. And, you know, that experience was uh, very valuable to me. And I, you know, I, I like to, I guess, take my uh, good experiences from my PhD and uh, apply them to my students now. Um, my research interests are mainly around computer architecture, um, security, uh, although uh, that, that's a very broad term and you can actually look at this uh, research from many different angles. And so right now I actually have many different projects that are perhaps not directly computer architecture security uh, themselves, but uh, they are definitely kind of in the periphery of that field. Uh, so some of the projects that we're working on, I have um, one student uh, is working with a uh, Raspberry Pi um, to try to implement a Spectre attack on an in-order processor. So if you're familiar with computer architecture, you will understand what that means. Um, then uh, we are also working uh, with a group at uh, Brown University. We're collaborating with them on uh, developing a caching mechanism for secure memory systems uh, to improve the overhead uh, that's uh, in secure memory systems. Um, we're also working uh, on a collaboration with another faculty here in the CS department on uh, trying to use uncertainty quantification to see if we can do uh, something uh, with quantifying the security risk in uh, systems. Um, and then uh, finally, I'm also working uh, with another uh, faculty here in the CS department on uh, developing a verification system for hardware security. And I guess this list is not uh, complete. I have a couple more projects here. Um, like Shiv and Christine mentioned, I'm also part of the Democracy and Technology Center. Um, and we're working on very exciting work there on evaluating the impact of uh, these Russian bots that they had uh, on uh, the 2016 elections and we're looking to expand that work uh, to the current setting and see how we can actually make um, an improvement in democracy uh, through computer science. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so if you have any questions or you're interested in any of the things I mentioned or you're in general in general interest in doing research in computer architecture, just reach out to me. Um, you can find me, I think you can also find my name. It's not very common either. So um, you can just Google my name and you'll find my website on CU's uh, Bowler uh, website. So, all right, I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks Tamara. Um, Eric, Eric Ustro. Hello. Um, I think I'm one of the, uh, the oddballs that Eric talked about earlier, but uh, uh, so I'm, I'm in uh, ECEE, but uh, have a joint appointment in a uh, uh, courtesy appointment in CS and advise students in computer science and double E. Um, my research generally is, is in computer security and networking, um, but I do a lot of stuff lately in uh, censorship circumvention. So one of the projects that I'm really excited about that we're working on now and have been working on for the past few years is we've deployed a proxy um, in the middle of the internet, basically, uh, and uh, and our server and using this to help users get around censorship in countries like China and Iran and these very heavily censored uh, uh, regions. And we have about a hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand users at this point, um, and and still growing, um, and have some new sort of tweaks that we're that we're doing and sort of next generation things and um, a lot of stuff going on with that project and and uh, definitely looking for students that are interested and want to work on that. Um, 
Uh, more generally, I've done other research looking at sensors, different ways that sensors can block proxies or, or tools, uh, and trying to find them before sensors can find them and so that we can fix them and make them harder for sensors to block. Um, and then lately, I've also been looking at uh, sort of other applied cryptography applications, uh, looking at the Signal Messenger app, if you use that, uh, and doing some security analysis there and, and trying to look at some of the, the recent features that they've released. Um, but generally interested in, uh, you know, security broadly, uh, computer networking, uh, have another project looking at routing loops and doing internet wide scanning things. Um, we do regular internet wide scans from uh, from CU. We also do a lot of looking at network taps uh, at CU and uh, what we can learn from that. Um, and I've also uh, touched a little bit on cryptocurrencies. So taught a course on uh, cryptocurrency security. And uh, um, so if you're interested in Bitcoin, Ethereum and and all that crazy weird world, then uh, then yeah, that's a, a lot of fun to, to do as well. Um, and then I guess uh, just as a note, I think uh, Eric has kind of touched on this a little bit, but I just want to say, you know, Boulder is a really great place to live, right? This picture here, I think is, uh, you know, this, this, this is me on top of the third flat iron uh, in, in Boulder, right? Uh, so, so even professors get out sometimes and, and do things. Um, but, uh, but it's a great place to live, right, for, for climbing, for hiking, for skiing, for biking, right, all the outdoor things, beautiful place. Um, and uh, and uh, that's something that, uh, that you don't really see a lot of in, in, uh, in U.S. universities, especially. I think that's, that's a pretty unusual thing for us. So um, with that, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, so Sangte or Dirk or any other professor that joined, do you want to say anything before we move on? We didn't have a slide. Um, yeah, so this Dirk, um, I just wanted to mention, so uh, Sangte and I um, have current projects in wireless and 4G and 5G security, um, have been doing more things related to um, uh, um, yeah, so some of the work that was presented there um, on um, using programmable networks in uh, 4G, 5G security and um, tele or, uh, telemetry systems. And we have a student working on a paper that should be due today, uh, hopefully, on uh, implementing distributed systems through a combination of programmable switches and programmable edges. Um, and uh, a fair amount of work in wireless networking as well, beyond just sort of 4G, 5G aspects. Okay. Uh, Sangte, you want to mention anything? Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, Dirk uh, already mentioned the um, about the LT and 5G. So, uh, my research area uh, to make the internet faster and then reliable and secure. So, uh, basically, that covering wired and wireless networks, um, including cables. Uh, weird though, but taxis and TSL, and also the uh, wireless networks and yeah, basically that you know designing protocol, internet protocol for you know both of this network, video streaming, storage system, wireless sensing, uh, etc. So Eric mentioned right, so he had a uh, industry experience. So I also has uh, five or six years of industry experience uh, before coming here and. Also, uh, you know, created uh, three startups and also work as a chief architect for uh, my colleague, uh, Tom Bush company as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you are interested in just contact me. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Sangte um, also designed TCP Cubic, which is the default congestion control algorithm in Linux. So it's um, some pretty cool stuff. Let's see. Sorry. Okay. Um, fun. So, so yeah, we live in a, in a great place. And, and as a result, we like to take advantage of it. So, you know, I take my students out hiking once or twice a year. Um, we have a barbecue in fall and spring that we do at the systems lab um, where we, we grill out all sorts of great food and, and have a nice time. Um, we travel to lots of conferences. This is us at Mobisys um, last year in, in Korea. Um, uh, so, uh, we, 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 we work hard, but we also, you know, play hard and there's a lot of great stuff to do in, in Boulder. And I think Rajri might've had some resources on, on, uh, just more generally about CU and, and the area that, that y'all can check out. Um, 
there's lots of other benefits. Um, I think, like I mentioned, you know, Boulder, Denver area is a huge tech hub. As a result, we have lots of companies here. This is an ever-growing list that's just kind of hard to keep track of. Um, we have national labs, a lot of national labs here, NREL um, with energy, um, NIST, the standards, NOAA um, with uh, atmospheric sciences, um, NCAR. Um, there's, there's, and, and, and they're often working in areas that are very technologically um, heavy. And as a result, there's a lot of collaborative opportunities. Um, this is us visiting the NREL campus um, sometime uh, last year. Um, startup scene is also pretty good. Um, you, a lot of the faculty, as, as y'all heard, have, have been involved in, in startups. Eric Keller, who um, um, didn't join, is also uh, having, he has a startup right now. Uh, Tam, who didn't join, has some startups. Um, so, so there's a really healthy startup scene here um, at the university and, and within Boulder itself. Um, so, so it's great opportunities uh, for those that are, that are interested in um, careers and, and things outside of academia or, or if you have research that's, that's super impactful, there's a great way to um, you know, get that revved up uh, through our startup scene here. Um, I think that's it. I'm getting beeped at in my ear. Um, so I think we can probably open the floor for questions and answers if, if any students want to ask questions with a reminder that um, we are recording this session. Um, if you also want to ask a question, you can uh, type me or Rajshri a private um, chat and, and we can also read the uh, question out as, as well. And you can ask general questions. You can ask questions about CU Systems Lab. You can ask questions to individual faculty, or maybe there's some project you're interested in. Um, really, the, um, uh, the floor is very open. Whatever, whatever kind of um, interests you, you can uh, or, or query or question you might have. Just, just go ahead. Feel free. Don't be shy. Uh, hey, Eric. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so you had mentioned which, which Eric, me or um, Eric Wistrow? Uh you, Eric Rosner. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, or I'm not sure if it was you or or, or maybe the different Eric, but um, uh, it was said before that uh, one uh, advice uh, for looking for a professor is to see like if they have funding so that they could mm -hmm. uh, you know take on additional students next year. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard like mixed things of, you know, sometimes it's like a good idea to like message them and check like, do they have funding or like look up on the NSF if they have grants that they recently got. And I've also heard the exact opposite saying that you shouldn't worry about things like that as a applicant. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Sure, and I'll let all our faculty jump in. I mean, the, the, the best thing that you want to look for, maybe I'll just start with a, with a um, more abstract questions like what you want to look for an advisor. And the best thing is to look for for fit. You know, make sure that you're interested in the research, talk with the professor um, and, and talk with their students and make sure this is a person that you might be able to get along with uh, because you're going to be with them, you know, for five or six years. So it's a long relationship and it's important to have a healthy relationship. So that's, that's the very first most important thing is, is the fit. Um, new faculty, and then like being strategic, it just depends. Um, new faculty almost always have startup funds. So new faculty almost always have money to hire students. Um, faculty with funding, I think are much more likely to be actively looking for students. Um, faculty without funding might not just have the budget to um, add students in, but there's always like TA slots and things that faculty have access to. So if there's a student who really wants to work with the faculty, the faculty doesn't have any funding, um, you can always apply for, you know, more funding um, and, and apply for grants as professors were constantly doing that. So I wouldn't be scared if there's a faculty that maybe doesn't have funding. Um, I wouldn't skip them over for sure. The best way I think is reaching out, but don't also be discouraged if you don't get a response from an email because professors get so much email that it's hard to keep track of it all. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it might help to do something like that, but I, I think the fit is the, the most important thing, like reading the papers and, and projects and things that professors are working on and finding what resonates with you is, is probably the best. And then, you know, if you read those papers and projects um, and, and you have questions or insights or avenues for future work or ideas, email those to the professor. That's a great way to get the conversation started. Okay. I don't know if any other faculty wants to jump in there. 
I, can I say something? Um, honestly, uh, for me and my students, I would rather my students not worry about funding. Um, I think if I hire a student, I commit myself to fund them one way or another. Um, I also know, and Rashri can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that CU Boulder actually guarantees five-year fundings for all CS That's students. True. So um, while what Eric said is true, that you know faculty that have funding are more likely to be looking for students, um, I don't think that should be something that uh, should change your decision to be with a faculty or not um, because as Eric also mentioned you know um, the most important part is fit uh, that you have a good fit with your advisor because you will be uh, with them for a long time and you will go through many ups and downs especially the downs um, so you want someone that you know that can support you that can have a good chemistry with you and understand you and that can give you everything that you need to succeed um, and that is beyond the funding uh, question right so yeah I just wanted to add that yeah, great point. I, 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 I would add that, you know, like, feel free to talk to multiple faculty, you know, don't so just think that you can just talk to one, you know, I mean, just talk to multiple faculty, you know, just make up your mind up. The whole idea here is, you know, you are basically trying to figure out, you know, who, you know, your, based on your research interest, who you can work best, you know, and, uh, um, you know, uh, it's perfectly fine, you know, that, you know, you talk to some faculty, you get admitted here, and then, you so perfectly find that you change your faculty advisor based on your research interests and all. All that thing is pretty flexible and uh, you know uh, fine actually. So, so it's basically right. as uh, uh, Tamara and uh, Eric said, you know, it's the fit that you should focus on. Chemistry fit, you know, those are the things that matter most. Makes sense. Uh, Dirk has his hand up. Oh, I was just going to emphasize what um, Shiv was just saying, which is that. Um, it's it's not like chattel slavery. <laughs> um, if you come to one faculty member and you decide, oh, this isn't working, you're free to go and work with others uh, for that. And so one of the things to look at is uh, to make certain that there would be also multiple people in an area that you would want to be able to get advice from, work with, um, make certain that there's a sufficient community of students um, for them. So for example, in the computer systems area, uh, there's a couple of different reading groups. There's a security re reading group that meets every Wednesday. There's several faculty in that area. If you're interested in security, um, you know, you can use that as a, both a, a community and then um, multiple guidance, which you'll always need during your thesis. Okay. Uh, I've got another hand up here and Sage, and then I have a private question, but let's do on and Sage first. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Nate. I'm wondering okay. if it's possible to volunteer in a lab at CU for a few weeks before um, before being admitted, it's, basically it's, as a way of kind of you know figuring out what works for me, what's what's a good fit. In it's a possible. Lab. Yeah, good question. It's possible. Um, just depends on the professor. I think Tam has, you know, worked with students before they've joined. Uh, I have one student who's thinking about grad school um, and, and is also kind of working in my lab. Um, so it's possible. You just need to find a professor who's who's willing to do it. Um, and then you need to make sure that you, you also have the time to, to be able to, um, to do it as well. Okay, thanks. No problem. I've got a private question here. Um, how likely are professors who have funding to fund master students? Um, it happens. It, 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 we have uh, one nice thing about CU is we actually have pretty strong master students. Um, I've had master students work on my research projects, be co-authors on my papers. I'm actively working with master students now. I'm, ex I'm excited to work with them. Um, so uh, it, it just depends on the um, on, on a certain situation, I guess. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment more on that, but I don't have any qualms about it as long as the student's strong, um, interested in the, in the project and, and, and has the time to, to work on it. I would, I would say though for master students, try to get involved as soon as you can because the um, longer that you're around CU, the, the more impact you can have on, on a project. Um, if, you know, if it's your last semester at CU, um, it might be harder to get funding unless you've already worked with that professor, taken their class, or have a ton of experience um, in the area that they're working on. Yeah, I mean, that's the main thing, you know, like you want to uh, get, uh, you know, um, familiar with the faculty as early as possible. 
Um, one good way to do that is basically take their class. You know, I mean, uh, that, that's one way to do it. Um, I think uh, if you are in a research-based master's program, you know, there is a requirement that you have to do independent study. Uh, so it will help you, you know, if you uh, interact with the faculty as early as you can so that, you know, you can have. And uh, uh, at least in my case, you know, basically uh, I have had students who started with me as uh, uh, independent study. One semester they did independent study and then we converted them into a uh, MS thesis, you know, based on, you know, the project that we started doing, you know. And so definitely, uh, you know, uh, try to interact with the faculty as much as early as you can, you know, because you, you'll be here as a master's student, you'll be here only for two years. Uh, and more importantly, you know, that is, if even if you are like thinking about, you know, doing PhD, even if you are coming here as a master's and, you know, it's a good way to interact with faculty and that will help you with making that decision whether you want to transit to a PhD program, you know. Perfect, okay, thanks Shiv. Um, more questions. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute. Um, what are the prospects for MS course-based students? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question all the way, but I will say Rajshree has a more general info session for grad school. Um, Rajshree, how do they, are you, if, Rajshree, I don't know if you're still there, but how do they access this um, more general info session? So I have it listed in the virtual session. I think Sukanya, you've already been accepted and you've deferred if I'm not mistaken. And so if you're a course-based master's student, and definitely, again, you have to kind of connect with one of the research labs and the work that they're doing. And these sessions are to help you guys figure that out. And if a faculty advisor is interested to advocate to switch you to the research option, we can switch you. Um, as long as you have a faculty advisor who says, yes, the student is going to be working in so-and-so project, and we'll be doing either independent study work or thesis work, that's all the grad comm needs to, to switch you to the research-based option. And again, it's not like uh, faculties will not say kind of like, oh, you're a course-based student, you can't come and listen to our research talks. Everyone can, and especially in the Zoom world, and more and more students have been able to actually attend these sessions because there's no room cap. Um, so there are many opportunities for you all to learn about the research that's happening. And of course, if you have more questions, reach out to me, attend one of my virtual sessions. You can RSVP, uh, you are on the Slack as well, I know, so you can ping me in Slack as well and we can have the conversation there as well. I hope that helps. Yeah. yeah, and I've signed that form, it's not a big deal. And I don't think any professors look at if a student is course-based or research-based MS, they just, they look more at an individual student than, than what sort of student they are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the other, other thing uh, I think Rashley can provide more information is uh, we are having these pre-research advising sessions nowadays, you know, I think every Tuesday or something, you know where you can learn more about uh, the research that uh, different faculty are doing. And, you know, if you want to learn more about that, you know. Yep, and those sessions are for students to figure out. And so what I'm doing right now is we're gonna have this, this on the website, all the sessions we have, we've had so far, including virtual session, uh, recruitment sessions and pre-research advising sessions, we'll have it available on our website, the videos, so people can actually watch those videos and learn more about it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Now's your chance, don't be shy. I can always cut the video at this point if uh, <laughs> you get too embarrassed by your question afterwards. Eric, maybe you wanna also mention the resources. So. Uh, what are the research tools and so forth that students would have access to? Oh, like our, I see, like our test beds and things like that? Yeah. Okay. Dirk, what sort of test beds do you have available oh. <laughs> at CU? Uh, well, so I mean, so there are a variety, you know, so different faculty who have different concentrations. So for example, uh, Tam Vu's students do a lot of work on uh, PCB board design and electronics design for some of the devices that they have. 
Uh, in the computer systems lab broadly, we have a um, an operating 4G and now a 5G network um, plus radio isolation boxes for the work that we do on wireless so we don't go to jail uh, for that. We are also working with, um, you know, Boulder is home to a number of national labs and one of the national labs is a campus of the National Institute of Science and Technology. And we work with them on having spectrum monitoring hardware uh, scattered around the university. That's now their equipment using sites we used to use. We also have um, a small amount of, of um, on-premise hardware for, with, um, for example, programmable switches and uh, what are called smart NICs and um, some servers to basically use for development and driving um, server-based uh, computing. And then as with most uh, research places now, if you're doing work in the computer systems or distributed systems area, students have access to facilities like Cloud Lab, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And that's used to, um, uh, to be able to do um, sort of any distributed or computational system, uh, plus other labs like Chameleon Lab um, uh, or Chameleon Cloud. Am I missing? So you have some other tools and facilities no. as well? No one. Do you want to briefly touch on? Because your stuff is usually pretty cool, like some of the equipment and things that, that, that you have. Did you say Nolan? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I cut out right then. And uh, yeah, so you know, for detecting uh, for for work we do with with tampering with uh, or detecting tampering on ATMs and payment terminals and so forth. Uh, I have a number of um, law enforcement contacts who funnel to me uh, this hardware when they find it, the skimming hardware. So uh, we have some uh, basic uh, basic terminals like you might find on a gas pump and the hardware that attaches to those to steal credit and debit card information. Uh, and then we can use that, use that hardware to test detection mechanisms and to, to reason about uh, the properties of these systems. Um, that's what I, I mean. So that's what I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I have a variety of just, you know, Wi-Fi access points and things donated by Meraki, cameras, microphones. Um, let's see here, there's another question, and then uh, GPU boxes. Uh, another question, uh, if I want to contribute to a project which needs involvement in both systems and ML, are there options? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of us are working at the interface of systems and ML right now. It's a very hot area to be working in. It's an area you can have high impact in. Um, I don't know, maybe just show of hands from the faculty. I don't know if this is recorded, but I'll, so if, the, if it's not, I'll just say the names, like who's working at the intersection of systems and ML right now? Um, Everybody. Everyone's <laughs> raising their hand. Everyone's yeah. now raising their hand. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really hot area. Um, the recent advancements in deep learning have been exciting for a variety of reasons. And, and as a result, we're, we're looking to either build systems that are smarter or, or build systems that aid these um, machine learning algorithms in doing their jobs? Um, yeah, good question. Okay, I think we're at time, um, but we, I, I can certainly stick around if anyone else has other questions they, they wanna ask, um, but I'll give it one last second for any last questions. All right, well, thanks um, all these prospective, prospective students for joining um, and, and the faculty here at CU. Um, we love working with students. You know, that's why a lot of us are in academia. Uh, so we hope to hear from you. We hope to see your applications uh, come uh, application season later this fall. Uh, if you have questions about individual research or individual faculty, please, you know, reach out to them. Uh, I will say it does help a lot to maybe read some of their papers and things before reaching out um, so you can maybe catch their eye and um, uh, get, a, get a better chance of, of getting a reply. Um, but other than that, I'm going to stop the recording.